I'm working with Autodesk as a technical specialist covering uh, some solutions. Okay, and my colleague, Sorin. My name is uh, Sorin. Uh, I am uh, also a technical specialist based here in Dubai. Uh, yesterday we had a session on uh, parametric design. As some of you, I, I think most of you, I saw you yesterday. So um, uh, today we were going to talk about another interesting topic. So I'm, I'm happy to see so many of you here. And uh, let's, let's get started. So the title of today's session is Generative Design. So as you can see, it's based on design. And before that is the generation of multiple designs. You're going to see how we can do that now very efficiently and very quickly. Okay. Before we delve into the topic and how Autodesk is actually shaping the world of design in many different disciplines, let's go back in history and let's talk about the evolution. As it's once uh, said in the past, change is the only constant in life, right? Everything is changing. We already know that early on in the days, we, mankind, we used to hunt for prey and move from one location to the other. That changed from the hunt uh, age to the farming or agriculture. Whenever the, the, the human being was able to plant uh, plants and have crops, then they settled in certain locations and civilization started to grow. That was called the uh, age of agriculture. Then uh, in the past two centuries, a couple of centuries, we had the industrial revolution. This is where we started to build equipment, factories and machines to do things for us. And lately we had the information age where we, had, uh, we started to have a lot of information we came up with the uh, computing machines, and by the way, that's the first Macintosh, uh, Apple Macintosh computer. Back then in 1984, when it was introduced, that was a revolution in terms of design, because it had the mouse, and it, has a, it had actually a user interface, a graphical user interface. So you can see how things are evolving with time. This is all good, but now we're moving into the future. And once we talk about information, or now the augmented age, and what I mean by augmented age is basically leveraging the power of the computing, uh, power that we have in the cloud, plus the human being intelligence. Now, we already know that the tools already have evolved. And as we say in Arabic, al-ma'rifa asiratu adawatiha, or if I want to translate it to English, knowledge is bounded or restricted by its tools. So once we invented the microscope, we were able to discover that there are bacteria or certain organisms that cause harm to the human body. The same thing applies to design or other tools as well. So when we had this simple tool back then in the uh, Stone Age, it did a very simple thing, basically striking an object, striking an object. And then we came up with more refined tools like the chisel. And then the uh, artist used to use the chisel to make some uh, sort of art. And nowadays we have the iPads, the tablets, and the computers. All of these do the, pr pretty much the same thing. The only thing that we've automated the process, we've made it a little bit more digitized, but still requires the input from the designer or the human being himself. This is why what we, uh, Soren and my colleagues covered in the early sessions wa was more about the passive design. So it's tools plus human input. This is what we call passive. Without the human input, you cannot basically come up with any design or any output. What we're moving into right now, and what we're going to show you today in this presentation, is basically the generative part. So leveraging the computing power, leveraging the power of the computer to come up with designs, to come up with alternatives. Once you graduate and you move into the uh, working uh, scenario, you will have certain constraints or requirements by your employer. You will find in the workplace that there is a limited time to ideate or conceptualize. So the, the, the owner or the client or whoever you are working for usually has very limited time uh, frames where you want to deliver uh, designs or ideas. And this is a constraint that you will face. Another constraint or a struggle is basically teams are constrained by engineering expertise. So you'll have many different disciplines within your team, but you will find that with time you have limited expertise within your team. You need to explore and maybe get some more expertise from other sources. The third one is downstream processes are considered during, uh, processes are not considered during design. Meaning, if I come up with a design right now that's very fancy, let's say 
a hybrid car that goes from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in one second. That's possible. But if I want to manufacture the car, maybe I don't have the technology right now to manufacture that type of car. I don't have the right engine, I don't have the right battery, etc., etc. So having in mind what technology is available to produce that product is very essential. The fourth one is the late stage changes are cost prohibitive. Usually when you are designing any product or any building or any object, you go through phases. And once you are in the detailed design phase, once you are finalizing and refining your de design, if the client or whoever is asking you to design makes any change in the design, that's really very much time consuming and not cost effective. You need to like re uh, do the redesign uh, from scratch. So these challenges are being addressed by what we call generative design. And Autodesk is a leader in generative design as you will see later on. How we're gonna tackle these basically as such. This is a well-known curve for project management. It also applies to design. What you see at the very bottom is the uh, lifespan of any project or basically any design. You start with the planning, where you have some ideas about what you have to produce. You have a preliminary or conceptual design. Then you refine your design. You construct it or produce it. And then you hand it over to the uh, owner or the client. At the top, on the y-axis, you find effect of that design, the cost to produce that design and effort. So whenever you move upwards, it's higher effect, higher cost, and higher effort that's needed to produce the design. If you look at the uh, gray curve, this one, the light gray curve, you find that most of the today's workflows in design favor spending a lot of effort in this area, the detailed design. So this is where you have this jump over here. What we at Autodesk are trying to do is push this part of effort and intelligence into the early conceptual design. Why is that? Let's have a look at the blue and the red curve. It's well known from all the studies worldwide that as you go towards the end of the design or the project, the performance, as you can see there, the blue line, the, the performance of the project or the design goes down. So you're not able to quickly affect the performance of that project. Inversely, if we look at the cost of making changes, it goes high. So instead of focusing on this stage, we're moving all the effort into the conceptual design where the cost of making changes is less and the impact on performance is high. Okay, this is the base for generative design. So to define what is generative design from Autodesk, Autodesk generative design is simply design exploration technology. Once you explore, you, you have multiple alternatives. That's simply put in three words. So we're simultaneously generating multiple CAD-ready solutions based on two major criteria. So let's suppose you want to design a car. Back to the uh, car example. You want to know what is the available technology that can produce that car in terms of uh, lithium-ion batteries, uh, what have you. Uh, motors, etc. So this is where we specify our constraints. This is the technology. These are the constraints we have in mind. And definitely, we want to have the requirements in terms of performance. We want to have the car to be highly efficient. Uh, speeds uh, go from 0 to 100 and so and so, etc., etc. So two major things to bear in mind for generative design. Requirements, constraints, and output requirements. Very simple. So if we look again into the conceptual or the uh, current st state of doing designs, this is how things are. So you develop designs in the concept stage. And then once you move into manufacturing, you start to validate those options that you've come up with. And usually once you're working, once you graduate, you will come up with a couple of options. You can't by any chance come up with hundreds or thousands of alternatives. It's not feasible. You don't have time to do that. So usually come up with three to four alternatives. You validate which one is the most efficient one, and then you move it into the manufacturability stage where you can basically produce it. This is the what's ongoing right now. And then it goes from design to fabrication. What the generative design technology from Autodesk is allowing everyone to do is early on in the project, you just specify the constraints and the output requirements, the performance, and automatically the power of the cloud, the infinite computing power, is going to deliver you with all possible alternatives, infinite number of alternatives, thousands of viable designs. 
And with that intelligence as well, you're able to validate, you are able to see which one is the required design that uh, basically satisfies your requirements and move it into the production. Hence, you save this amount of time. So this time is being saved throughout and you're basically getting a better design because you've explored tens of thousands of options. To make it clearer for you, if we wanna go, for example, from Boston in the US to San Francisco or Los Angeles, whatever. Back in the day, they used to go all around the South American continent to get from point A to B. And then people get smarter, got smarter. They decided to uh, create the Panama Canal and that saved 60% of the travel time. Basically, we have some sort of optimization, but it's not enough. So this is what I would call the red one is the pencil and paper design. The uh, yellow one is like CAD or computer-aided design. Whereas with generative design, you're exploring every other option that's out there. So maybe you need to go by train or track, uh, truck or plane. So other sources are also available. And all of that is being doable because you're basically plotting all these alternatives depending on, for example, the cost of transport, the security, the speed at which you get the uh, uh, goods uh, transferred from one place to the other, and definitely the cargo size. So depending on your needs, the requirements, you pick any of those routes. This is what generative design is basically doing, giving us too many alternatives. Another example from real life, you know that this is the time where everybody is fascinated with drones, right? This is an example where a designer specified just the requirements and the weight of a drone and let the software automatically produce all these different design alternatives. So this is the main body of the drone on which the uh, motors will be attached to and the electron electronics uh, boards will be inside or at the center. So as you can see, infinite number of solutions being generated. Tell me if you are a designer or if you even go to uh, engineering and you study engineering, any discipline, can you come up with all the, these different uh, design alternatives? It's impossible. Think of the nodes. Think of the uh, thin slices or thin uh, areas that are connecting one object to the other. It's basically computer. So, to make it simple, for you, those of you who attended uh, yesterday's session, you knew about computational design and parametric design. What's different in generative design is basically, we have one human, one designer, that has his ideas, requirements, and output requirements. He's using the machine learning algorithms right? So the intelligence of the programming and the infinite computing power. You already know that everybody now is using the internet and there are too many different server locations worldwide where all of our services are being taken care of. So everything like Facebook, like Instagram, like everything is stored in the cloud. All of these processing is being done in the cloud. We're using that same technology, basically Amazon servers, to create all these different design options to come up with the design alternatives that you see to the very right, okay? So hundreds to thousands to even sometimes tens of thousands of design alternatives. Whereas with the session uh, from yesterday, you will see that we have one human or a group of uh, engineers or designers working with a computer or a CAD software, like AutoCAD for example, or Revit or anything, or Fusion, and then they're not using the uh, computing power, infant computing power, so they come up with like one, two, or three alternatives, basically, but not hundreds of alternatives. So this is just to differentiate between the two. Just okay. a second or more. So you guys understood what's the difference between computational design and generative design? Is it clear? So yesterday I was talking about computational. Um, you met, uh, you've seen that I have done all the inputs myself. So all the nodes that I have created it was done by me, right? So I have to I have to tell the software how to automate things. So this is a step further. Here we use AI, we use the, the power of computers to generate the design for us, okay? So we just have to specify the constraints and we have some programmers who already made all these algorithms and we just have to uh, specify the correct inputs and let computers and, and not just one, we can use uh, the internet to connect to thousands of computers worldwide to, to get uh, design results. So this is another uh, design approach. Thank you, Mo. 
And basically at Autodesk, if you check our website, you will find a lot of material on the future of making things. So Autodesk is inventing too many uh, technologies that will really shape the way, not only how we design things, but also how we make them. So it's more about the design and make process, from design to production. And we're going to see examples towards the end of the session, how companies like, yes please. Yes. My question is that oh, how does the computer or the program, for example, understand that, okay, I want a chair or I want um, a plane, okay. a car? Okay. Or good question. Huh? Very so good question. You heard a question? So, h how does the computer know that I want a chair or I want a plane or uh, what do I want? The, the, we have to, to tell this, the computer some constraints. It's not like he can read our mind. So. Uh, we still need to define the problem. So I will show you uh, how it works, a real case example uh, from the generative design interface and how we, we specify the problem. We still need to uh, define the problem so the software or the, the AI can help us generate them. So you still have to, to say wh what elements you want to preserve what elements you want to remove, and then the, the algorithms will out, uh, will create these design options. But I think you will understand better after I show you the example. Okay. So, back to your question. So, we want to design a chair. This is what the software will give us at the end result. Too many different alternatives. The good thing about generative design, it's not only providing us with alternatives, it's giving us the performance of each and every alternative depending on the criteria that we decide. So in terms of a chair, for example, we need to have a chair that will take the load of a person who's 100 kilograms or 100 kilograms. And this is where we specify different criteria. So for example, let's suppose this one, 120, anything that goes above 120 is acceptable. So these are different criteria showing, in this case, displacement. So this chair is stable. There is li very little displacement. The material usage is very high. So you can see against each of uh, the alternatives which one maybe makes sense. And then the designer can pick the design of choice depending on his requirements. Again, if we look into some of the alternatives, a designer nowadays might come up with this simple design, right? Generative design can propose other alternatives. This is design two, slightly optimized for material usage. So this is uh, same design, same performance, can take up the same load, but if you want to manufacture it, it will take less material. And we're going to see how we can manufacture this complex chair with all these uh, connections inside. And as a most optimal design, maybe we can end up with something like that. So you can see the weight reduction. So the most optimal design is 2.9 kilo, uh, kilograms, and this one is 10.3 kilograms. Performance-wise, they're the same. Imagine a car nowadays, like those electric cars we have from Tesla. If they can just reduce the weight by almost like 70%, how much that will uh, improve the efficiency and the uh, reduction in terms of fuel consumption or electricity comp consumption. So this is what the generative design is allowing us to do. Can you, uh, just wanna add one more thing to the chair. Uh, so you, you will see that all these chairs, they have something in common. They all have the same height, so this is one constraint. So this is what I have to tell the software or the, the, the generative design platform. I want this uh, height and I want this surface and I want the chair to support X load, like a person that has I don't know, 100 kilograms or uh, maybe there are two kids or two persons that want to see that, I can increase that. So. The only uh, inputs that I have to give is the height and the load. And then generative design will come up with, with these uh, alternatives. And it will automatically distribute the material where it's needed. So um, it will give me more option and I can study which one is the lightest and wh which one has the lowest cost of fabrication. OK, means of production. So. As we mentioned, it's not just about the design, it's also about how do we produce those complex designs. 
and there is also a lot of innovation going on worldwide. What you're seeing to the top right of the screen is basically uh, an image taken or a picture taken from the uh, Airbus manufacturing plant. What they're doing with that technology, they're kind of spraying carbon fiber material which is very light in, in weight but very powerful, very strong, on top of the airplane fuselage, on the outer shell of the airplane. Nobody told Airbus that you can use it for this, but they've invented this way of applying the carbon fiber. So the material was not basically discovered by them, and the way of application was not also discovered by them. They, come up, they came up with this method to apply it on their fuselage and make it more strong and uh, more actually uh, durable. To the uh, bottom of the screen, you see this uh, printer. So this is what we call additive manufacturing. Do you know how things are being made around us? There are multiple of ways, one of which is additive manufacturing. What this actually uh, node is doing is, is printing 3D metal in real time. And I'm going to show you an example how we do that quickly. The end result of this innovation and in the technology of producing things is something like that. So this is a, uh, a sports, swear, sports shoe basically from Under Armour. This part that you see the sole of the shoe was designed using additive manufacturing, something similar to this, but just 3D printing rubber. The performance of that shoe is the best in the market in terms of lightweight and definitely flexibility for those who do CrossFit or uh, lifting. So just to give you some examples. Another example is from the manufacturing industry of vehicles. This is a case study from Lightning Motorcycles. And this is, we are inside of the Fusion 360, which Soren will show you how to work with it. We define the constraints, as you can see, we've defined the loads. So these are fixed parts that will take certain amount of load. We pick the materials, and then we ask the software to generate solutions. And as you can see, all the solutions are available. The solutions are basically plot against certain criteria, X maximum displacement versus, for example, maximum uh, stress. And then the designer can make it easy to pick which one can have uh, the, the maximum power versus the uh, lowest uh, mass or lowest weight. And this is how the software is basically doing the design. So it's going on iterations until it finds the most optimal design for us. Or once we pick that design, we can basically visualize it inside of the software. You can visualize all the stresses and all. all. So basically, it starts with, uh, we have to, to s define that this is, these are fixed. These parts are fixed, and then the software will generate multiple options, and it will start with a light, with a high volume of, of material, and will go through many iterations. Will remove the material where it's not needed. Basically, uh, this is the, the the process. And then helps us understand as designers how this product will be printed in, in 3D, because those printers usually print in layers, so they apply material one layer after the other. Not only additive or 3D printing, they also show us in the factory how the milling machine, the machine that will remove material, how will make that uh, in the factory itself. So from design to production. And definitely once it's done, it's ready to be shown to the public or the, uh, the users, it can be put into that uh, equipment or device of intent and you can see it there in uh, its right location. Hyperconnectivity. You already know that everything now is being connected, right? The era of connectivity. So what actually is going on, this is actually a DGI company, the one that does the drones. In 2014, they reported one, actually $4 million revenue, $4 million. In 2015, they reported $1 billion revenue. $996 million revenue increase in one year. So imagine once people or designers come up with new designs that are efficient, how they can basically uh, shape the market. This is a BioLight, a device that allows people going on camping or going to the desert, basically plug their mobile phones or iPads and just charge them. What this company did differently is that the energy being lost in terms of heat, they were able to capture that energy and transport it into fire. Imagine, that's the only one available worldwide that basically captures the heat being lost and generate fire that you can basically use it for other purposes. The same thing with cars. Now we know about the hybrid cars, electric cars, etc. Do you know that there are studies nowadays in the US where cars will be fully automatic 
driven by computers. And those cars will communicate with one another. So let's suppose I'm in my car approaching an intersection and there are other cars. So my car will send a signal to the other car to stop so that I will pass and not collide with the other car. So there is no more like red light, green light signal. It's all cars being connected to one another. Not only that, there is also a couple of studies on how do cars learn from one another. So a person who has a car, he did an accident with certain conditions. He can basically send that information to all other cars in the world to learn from his experience. So cars will be learning on their own. This is a lot about hyperconnectivity, and you can check it online. There are many case studies. One of the examples is the Mercedes-Benz uh, autopilot car, which is available, but still has to go some uh, regulations and approvals before it's fully available on our roads. Changing the nature of work. So we talked about the design, we talked about the era of connectivity. Managing to produce such designs actually requires maybe uh, labor of different expertise, different processes, and definitely certain technology like additive, additive manufacturing or subtract, subtractive manufacturing. All of this will be covered in a later session, in a later section during our session today. So as engineers, or for those of you who aspire to be engineers, the engineering outcome is basically from any design is to strike the right balance between performance and cost, right? I want to design something that performs up to my expectations, but within a certain cost. This is where we come up with different alternatives and how we produce them. Each one of these alternatives serves the purpose, but has a different cost to produce. And as you see, they look a little bit different, but per in fact, they all do the same job. So once we talk about this trade-off between the performance to cost to produce, we usually have this S-curve. And this S-curve, you can see it everywhere in the industry. So if you opt to go with something that's low in cost, low performance, you end up somewhere here. As you go to higher performance, as you can see, the cost goes higher and higher. Definitely, the, the pictures are just uh, for illustration, but it doesn't have to be the case of a Lambo or a Toyota Corolla. It can be any other car. And for us as engineers, we need to have this curve, all of these different options, in order to pick the best one that's suitable for us. So this is the trade-off. Cost to produce, and this is dependent on many other uh, constraints. Material that I'm going to use in my design. Is it uh, titanium? Is it plastic? Is it a metal alloy? Whatever. The processes in place, the labor who are doing the, uh, the process or the manufacturing, and definitely performance. And that could be defined in many different terms. So this is the challenge as designers. To give you an idea, and this is the example which my colleague Soren will cover later on, there was a challenge posted by General Electric in the US where they requested all students and even corporates to provide them with the best solution. Okay, I think uh, we've slipped down slide. Yeah, the best solution to this bracket. Imagine how many solutions did GE receive from its uh, competitors or the people who she uh, or the company basically con connected with. Over 780 different designs, ranging from very cheap ones to the very sophisticated ones that basically require new technologies in terms of manufacturing. That's not possible without generative design. And once we mentioned about the generative design, we mentioned something that it's using the infinite computing power. Back in the day, this is what it was required to get a couple of designs. So too many engineers, too many designers working together, you know, sending ideas or collaborating in one single platform. Nowadays, we're using the power of the cloud like the Amazon servers. So we're replacing or basically augmenting the power of humans with the power of uh, computing.
So the bracket has to support some loads, okay? And they release this uh, competition online for anyone to submit their design, and there was a price, and they wanted to see uh, what's the best uh, design option in terms of uh, strength and in ter terms of, of weight. So, uh, they, as, as Mo mentioned, they received hundreds of, of uh, designs. Uh, in the end, I think the winner was a student from Indonesia uh, who came up with, uh, with the best results. And all these hundred designs were actually designed by individuals. Uh, and they came up with different solutions. But I'll show you how we can replicate those hundreds of designs using generative design. So we can generate uh, hundreds, hundreds of designs using uh, Autodesk generative designs. And this is how the, the CAD, the initial bracket was, okay? That was the new. left and uh, at 45 degrees load and the static torsional so also a bending so all, all these loads were given to the uh, competitors and the, they asked us to to come up with the best design um, I'll show you uh, the steps and how we can uh, input those loads inside the, the tool so basically this is an example where we define the constraints for a drone, right? This is, these are the uh, 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 propellers of the drone, and then we have to define the fixed points, and then we input that information. The generative design will come up with different uh, designs. So how the algorithm works is actually trying to replicate nature, okay? Nature has evolved in billions of years and we have the this structure we look like this as we look today because of a generative design process done in billions of years not by computers but by nature okay we, our bones have the exact amount of, of material to support our bodies and to respond to the gravity that is dragging us towards the ground um, and probably uh, we were, our bones were bigger uh, initially, but because of uh, iterations and to thousands and thousands of years, the, the nature has ad adopt, adapted and the, the, the bones uh, reduced the, the size uh, progressively and they, we reached this uh, optimal uh, shape. Now we are using more and more our brains, so we are using less our muscles. So probably in the next 2,000 years, our bodies will adapt, okay? Instead of having uh, bigger arms and legs, we'll probably have bigger heads. I don't know. We will look weird. Or compared to people from 2,000, 3,000 years after, they will look at, at people from today and they will say, wow, they, look, they, they really have small heads. And this is how nature, this is uh, how uh, generative design works in the same the same way. It starts with with uh, uh, design, and then it, it will keep optimizing and go through iteration and iteration. Now, instead of waiting for billions of years, like the nature does, we have learned that from nature. We have
Okay? So what, our objective is to minimize mass, or we can choose minimize stiffness. In case we minimize the stiffness, we have to define the factor, factor of safety, or we can even define a mass target. We can say, well, I have a restriction, I want to have this bracket not more than 35.5 grams. I can even restrict the weight of the, of the bracket. So after I uh, specify the problem, it might be manufactured. But inside generative design, we have constraints. We, we can take in account the manufacturing process. So we can say it's unrestricted, meaning that we don't care about how this will be manufactured. We just want to see the options. Or we can say we want to see the, the additive manufacturing process that Mohammed was uh, explaining. And then we can also define the overhang angle. So how, what angle does the robotic arm can, can place material or the minimum thickness of the layer. When, we, when the 3D printer uh, applies layers, we can define the thickness of that layer. So we can, in conclusion, we can even look into the manufacturing uh, process and we can specify uh, the problem using uh, uh, the manufacturing techniques. And then last, we can uh, choose from different materials. Okay, uh, normally when we do a design, uh, by hand, we will calculate with one material. Then we have to go again, calculate with a different material. Then we go try a different material. Different materials have different properties. Some of more sol uh, have more strength. Some some they are more plastic. Some are more elastic. They, we have a hundred. Some are more expensive than the other. Of course, we want to use uh, the strongest materials, but maybe the strongest materials are too expensive. So that's why we can choose from multiple options, let the generative design show me all the options, and then I can compare the different results. So in this case, we will generate 18 studies, 18 uh, version of, of brackets. Okay, so I choose manufacturing materials, all this. So four times three, four manufacturing alternatives, times three materials, I will have uh, 12 um, uh, solutions. So this is what the generative design results look like. This is how they look like. They generate different outcomes, and then I can study the different uh, alternatives. And this video shows uh, exactly how we do it. So basically, we just have to define the design space. Three types, as I was mentioning. Space is open, so we can put there. So we import the geometry. We go to the design space, import geometry. We select different types of formats, so you can use <laughs> different CAD applications to create this initial, to create these shapes. And then very easily we can assign the geometry. You can see the interface is very simple. It's not something very complex. It can be used even by, by students and it's uh, very easy to use. And then we have to define the geometry that we want to preserve. So we can just one click, click the objects that we want to preserve. In the first step, we define the, the preserve geometry. So basically one, two, three, four, five, six. Six objects that we want to preserve. I can hide some objects and then I can select all of them in one go and I say one, all those should be preserved. Then the next step, 
geometry. And then the optical geometry. And that's different, we can leave it open so we don't give a starting shape. We, we can just say, take this and give me the results. So we have both options. Option one, optimize an existing design. Option two, uh, just uh, let the, the tool generate the designs for us without any starting shape. Okay, next we have to define the, the loads, okay, so, and the constraints. And we basically need to define the, the problem. First, constraints. So constraints are different than, uh, than, the, than the what to preserve and what to uh, uh, avoid. Here we, you know, objects in nature, they can translate or they can rotate, all the objects. Um, so in this case, we can uh, uh, select different constraints. Like for example, this has to be s to stay in the same position. They are not allowed to slide these objects here. So I, I have to place the lock there. Very easy. Just click on on the objects, and then you have here fixed directions. You can just click, and then if you click it, then it won't translate. Also, you can. Uh, define a, a fr frictionless constraint. So you can uh, s click on a surface, and if you click on the surface, it won't uh, move. And then the final step, we need to apply the loads. So we have pressure loads, force loads, different loads. We can click on, click on the objects and define the loads. Next step, specify the design requirements. So I have to define my objectives, my manufacturing options, and the materials. And here we can say minimize mass or maximize stiffness, the same like I was mentioning in the previous uh, slide. Factor of safety and the mass target. So in this case, 1.5 kg. Okay. Then manufacturing, so we can consider the additive manufacturing, and then I can specify different materials. So I want to see results from different materials. And once the study is, is ready, I can press generate, and then uh, I will have to wait for about 30 minutes, one hour, depending on the complexity. and the tool will generate this result. So the last step would be to explore the results. Explore the outcomes. Okay, so you can see the study is completed and then it generates all the, the results. I can use filters to see only some specific uh, results based on volume, based on mass. I, I can use the slider. I just want to see the brackets that have this kind of amount of volume. And I have different ways of uh, organizing the results. I can see them with a uh, tab nail. I can see them with all the details. So tab nail view, I can see all of them with a tab nail view. Then I can move to the next one. So I can see detail view with all the material properties, volume, mass, displacements, everything. So this is a very important process, actually. When we generative design has developed hundreds of thousands of examples, in this case, there are just 18, but we can generate as many as we want. And now we have to define which one is the most optimal according to my requirements. Maybe 
someone else and a different company will have different requirements. But according to my requirements, I can explore all the outcomes and select which one is the one that is suitable for, for uh, the initial constraints. I can see this kind of uh, graph view, so I can put two properties or many properties on a, on a chart. And then what I can do also, just expand one of the optimal results. So let's say this is the one that I'm targeting. I can rotate it so I can see exactly how it is. We have tools to uh, orbit and, and, and also we can visualize all the stresses. So high means it's a high stress and blue means a low stress. So we can even understand where the bracket is more uh, affected by the efforts. And what we can do, can export as an SAT, we can export it uh, in a CAD uh, format so we can process it further, or we can export it directly in an STL format and 3D print it. So uh, you can see that the uh, design process is much faster and more efficient. Instead of using hundreds of, of engineers or people, I can use a machine and I can generate hundreds of outcomes and then I can select the best uh, outcome for me. Okay, so you understood how the, how the tool works. Uh, you see it's not very complicated. You can play with it. You can, uh, uh, first you need a subscription to uh, Fusion 360. Then you can, as a student, you can get uh, generative design licenses so you can test out your, your design. Uh, I think we can stop now for a 10 minutes break and then we will show you more uh, examples, okay? See you at 11. Or not? Are you, are you planning to use it sometime in the future? Yeah? It's, it's uh, much easier, I mean, it's, it can help uh, your life, because as if you uh, if you're planning to go on an engineering career, you will be stuck in plenty plenty of calculations and plenty plenty of time spending just to to come up with different designs and optimize. So all this work uh, currently is done by by hand by by humans. So we can use this technology to uh, come up with these designs much faster. Another simple example that I want to show you, it's a, just a simple shelf, okay? So what the, the problem here, we want to create these brackets and we want to optimize. So the brackets, the supports in the wall. So it's similar like uh, the previous example, we have to define the problem, okay? So what is important here is where we will fix the supports. So we here it's where we have the bolts and the screws and the other distances. So basically this is just a, a CAD sketch. Yeah. So, so basically this is where you can leverage your knowledge of AutoCAD to specify the problem before implementing it in Fusion 360. Okay? Okay, so there we have the problem definition. And then we can, this is like a existing bracket that we want to optimize. So the screws is geometry that we need to keep or avoid. Obstacles, correct, yes, good. So you, you paid attention. <laughs> so the screws, actually, this geometry that we, there are obstacles, so the uh, uh, generative design should avoid. That's why they are marked with red color, okay? We can even extrude them and we can uh, make the obstacles even longer. So we can have uh, volumes where we don't want to have any material. And then the load cases, depending on what those shelves have to support, we can place the loads in different directions. In, uh, and then we can let the a generative design to come up with solutions. And this is what 
generative design came with. So this is the most optimal design for, for that problem. So a simple bracket can actually be redesigned and can be optimized to use less material and the end result is the same. It will support the same weight. We can, we can increase the load, of course. So I w it can support the same load as the previous, the traditional bracket, but with much less material. If we want to double the load, then generative to manufacturing so the process as I mentioned it's not just about the design but how do we manufacture that complicated design so we start with generative design and then once we're done with the uh, 3d object that we get from the generative design or fusion 360 we move into the manufacturing side of things and this is where we talk about additive manufacturing basically 3d printing there are many technologies you can basically 3D print in plastic or metal or titanium. And definitely once you print that object, you go into the last phase or before last, where you basically refine the edges or you refine the surfaces of that material. Because with 3D printing, you get some tolerances in terms of uh, unrefined edges. Final product, this is where the product is available and this is where you can basically test it for loads, you can simulate it and put it into your bigger picture of the design. So since I talked about additive and subtractive manufacturing, and this is where uh, it's very important to understand the difference, I would like to highlight what is each, okay? So su subtractive manufacturing is basically you start with a block of any object, a block of iron, a block of plastic, a block of titanium. And then the, the machines in the factory, we call them milling machines or grinding or what have you, they will start to dig into the uh, block to create a certain shape, an object that we would use in our design. This is what we call subtractive manufacturing. Basically, removing material by physical mechanical processing. I will show you a video on that. However, if we use the additive manufacturing, as you see, produce 5D milling capabilities, so in five dimensions or five different axes, let's say, five different axes. So this is subtractive. Let's talk about the additive. As I mentioned earlier, the designs that we come up with from the generative design, like Sorin mentioned, are highly complicated, highly complex. These internal structures, the links, cannot be produced by milling. Or sub imagine a tool that can go into and remove all this material in that fashion. We can do it. So once we're talking about generative design, most of the time we need the additive manufacturing technique to come up with those designs. And what basically is happening is just laying material in layers, a 3D printer. A sample of this is, for example, creating a blade. This is a simple example, a blade on top of this uh, rotor. So if I play the video, you will see that this device is printing in real time in 3D. Basically, laying titanium or, or laying metal alloys one layer on top of the other, one layer on top of the other. 
And with time, you will see that this object is basically going up uh, in the third dimension, in the Z dimension. So if I move the uh, video forward, you will see that this is after, for example, a couple of minutes, et cetera, et cetera, until you get into your final design. Differences. This is very efficient, allows us to basically come up with the generative design in mind, but it's not cost efficient. Why? Because it requires high-end technology and sometimes takes some more time to come up with the design. So just to bear in mind the differences between the two. And once we talk about additive manufacturing, like that example, scientists and engineers now are working on many different studies to come up with a new material. Now we're talking about the nanotechnology. So how can we leverage the 3D printing to print a material, create a material using the nanotechnology to, to come up with certain material properties? So what you see to the top right corner is basically the nanoscience technology lab from Autodesk. And this is where our engineers and scientists are using this generative technology and nanotechnology to come up with things like the human bone. Apparently God has created nature in its most efficient form. So what you see over there is a replica of the human body, is a replica of the bone itself. And if you create a human transplant organ like that structure and you put it in the human bone, the human body will adapt to it very quickly, will not basically uh, dis discover that it's an, um, an out outlier or like a body that's coming from the outside. No, it will basically adapt to it and build on top of it. Another example of generative design is how do we see or we understand those outcomes that Soren talked about for the bracket or other examples in a virtual reality environment. For those of you who know about 3ds Max, anybody knows 3ds Max? Perfect. So we have something on top of 3ds Max called 3ds Max Interactive. This is where you can create a virtual reality environment to basically simulate anything. You put the uh, VR headset on, and those examples that Soren created in generative design can be brought in into a virtual reality environment where you can basically rotate, check how is the size of one alternative is to the other. Not only that, it's very interactive in the sense you can highlight certain objects in the design and ask the software, show me all different designs that are very similar to this object or have a component that is very basic to that object. So makes the uh, life cycle or the process of selecting the best design very easy, not just on uh, 2D, but in a 3D virtual environment. Also with the uh, additive manufacturing, as I mentioned, we have 3D printing. So in Dubai, luckily we have uh, the 3D printed uh, office, the first 3D printed office in the world. And this is just a small video to show you how the 3D printing of that office took place. So first functional 3D printed office, and you can visit it outside. This is basically 3D printing the material, whether that is concrete or some composite material, printing the components and then attaching them one to the other. This is basically the process that went outside to build that uh, functional office. some statistics about the dimensions. And by the way, this is just part of the Dubai initiative to have about 25 to 30% of buildings in, UA, in Dubai 3D printed. So in the future, you will see that buildings are being 3D printed and taken to the site and then uh, basically fabricated or assembled. So this is just the beginning of a new era of construction. So additive manufacturing is basically taking uh, a lot of growth. So you can see from the curve from 2012 till 2018, and it's expected even to take even a higher growth and implementation throughout. As per the studies from McKinsey, McKinsey and other uh, consulting firms. And with additive manufacturing, we're able to come up with those different designs like the Under Armour, the heat exchangers, and many others. So complex designs from generative design should be basically manufactured with additive manufacturing. Now, just one thing to mention. So once we're talking about conditional manufacturing and whenever we have something that's not highly complex, so the cost, we need to have something that is low cost, not highly complex, we can go with the conventional 
manufacturing method. There's no issue at all. Once we want to go into something that is, in terms of complexity, is very complex, then we need to go with additive manufacturing, but that also comes at a certain cost. As I mentioned earlier, performance versus cost is always the challenge we have as engineers. And then once we talk about cost versus uh, benefits, in terms of cost, we need to have, for example, uh, part consolidation, we need to have uh, control over the packaging, the risk of not having the right employees uh, on the design and the fabrication, plus on the value side, we have to have reduced weight, improved cooling, etc., etc. So this is just to give you a very quick overview. It's fine, we're using uh, additive manufacturing because additive manufacturing is relatively a new technology. You do get sometimes some problems. So these complex shapes do get some problems while they're being fabricated. So just keep that in mind. The technology is evolving, but these problems happen from one time to the other. The good thing about the Autodesk software, this is actually Autodesk NetFab. So once the uh, design has been selected from generative design or Fusion 360, you can take it into NetFab and understand how the object will be 3D printed in real time. So how the layers will be, what is the thickness of the layer, how many micromillimeters, etc., etc. Basically, we can simulate the fabrication process as well. Yeah, exactly. So some of the case studies, and this is very interesting for you, to understand where is this technology, the generative design and the 3D uh, printing or additive manufacturing is being used. This example is a heat exchanger. So basically, fluid goes in and goes out to cool certain components. Any electronic device, a laptop, a, uh, a car, electric car, has to have a heat exchanger. Why? Because heat is being, or electricity or energy is being wasted as heat. So you need to dissipate that heat. To come up with such a design, complicated design, imagine the angles or the curves, you can do it on your own. This is why generative design is very useful. So under that box is this complicated design. One of the other uh, things that we talked about earlier is under armor. So I just let you watch this video on how they created the best, basically, sports shoe. Okay, one example. Another example, which we touched upon earlier, is the Lightning motorbike. These guys use the generative design technology to design this very high-speed electric bike. And you can see the specs, it's available online. So it's the Lightning LS218. The reason being to call it 218 because it goes to 218 miles per hour as top speed, almost like 370 kilometers per hour. They've designed those parts using generative design technology from Autodesk, and they've optimized the geometry and the material for each and every part of the uh, electric uh, bicycle, uh, electric bike, sorry. The end result 
is this one, LS 218. And by the way, it's the fastest production electric bike ever produced. So acceleration wise, and even efficiency wise, this is the fastest ever produced electric bike. And it can go double the mileage on the same amount of energy versus model Tesla S, the Prius Hybrid, and other well-known electric cars in the market. So just to give you an idea of things that are available uh, right now. GE, or GM, I'm sorry. Same for uh, GM Motors. The GM Motors is a large American car group. They have SUVs, they have sedans, they have uh, several brands. And they are planning also to use generative design to reduce the cost uh, for their uh, um, uh, cars. So basically, they want to use uh, generative design technology to uh, reduce the 30,000 percent, 30,000 parts uh, in their vehicles to reduce the, the volume. So this is a seat bracket, and if you want to go fast, you need a powerful engine and very light uh, car, right? And you can start to reduce the uh, volume and the mass from any any part. This is just a car seat. You imagine if you uh, reduce the car seat uh, bracket, you reduce uh, another component, another component, you can get 30% less uh, mass. You can go much faster and the consumption will be also reduced. So this video shows how they are using the generative design. Reduce the 30,000 percent, 30,000 parts uh, in their vehicles to reduce the, the volume. So this is a seat bracket, and if you want to go fast, you need a powerful engine and very light uh, car, right? And you can start to reduce the uh, volume and the mass from any any part. This is just a car seat. You imagine if you uh, reduce the car seat uh, bracket, you reduce uh, another component, another component, you can get 30% less uh, mass. You can go much faster and the consumption will be also reduced. So this video shows how they are using the generative design.
chose to use generative design as our design tool to come up with different options to achieve graphics. Normally, when we face a design challenge like that, we may come up with two or three different design options. But with generative design, we can come up with over 150 some solutions that we just couldn't have thought of with any other existing design tool. We formed a partnership with Autodesk. We thought it was a unique opportunity to really use those tools, deliver a design that we couldn't come up with any other way. We've gone through our, our normal set of test procedures that are required for this part. This part is so much better than the previous part. 40% mass savings at the same time getting 20% stronger. Far exceeded my expectations of what we could achieve. We have many different parts and pieces that are here, over 30,000 on average. Now the real challenge is to find all those different applications where we can apply the same principles of generative design to really optimize our beautiful program. So 40% mass reduction, 20% stronger. Airbus, we all know Airbus, right? One of the major uh, aviation leaders uh, in the industry. So Airbus has a very promising uh, vision for the future. It's called the Airbus 2050 vision. They're basically looking forward to come up with such airplanes, different arrangement of uh, the, the engines, different cabin fuselage that is kind of transparent to give a different experience for all the passengers. So this is a rendering of the uh, vision of uh, Airbus for the uh, plane that they're trying to build. And definitely they're planning to do that using generative design with Autodesk. So as you can see, LED lighting, the material changes in terms of transparency, smart materials, etc., etc. Now, to reach that vision in 2050, they've partnered with Autodesk and they started with one challenge in mind. If we can, as Airbus, minimize the weight of our components and come up with uh, smart designs, then we're able to reach that challenge. They started with one of the partitions that are available in the uh, airplane. So if you see the cabin crew, sometimes they pull their seats and they sit on them. The wall that's behind them, the bulkhead partition, is this one. And they've used generative design to optimize that geometry and basically satisfy the uh, load requirements. So as you can see, different iterations depending on force, depending on the mass, depending on the material usage, etc. And they were able actually, as Soren did in his example, isolate some of the unnecessary alternatives and then just work with the best four, five, or 10 uh, design options that the software provided them with. So here, as you can see, weight versus displacement. So in the aviation industry, there are very tight requirements about the deviation and about the performance of the uh, object. So maybe they would like to go with something that's 25 kilograms and that is able to displace by maybe uh, two, mi two millimeter only. So these were the uh, options. They've picked the one that's best suitable for them to satisfy the requirements and they've done all the simulation and analysis inside of our tools. Fusion 360 and others. This is the final outcome of the bulkhead partition. As you can see, this was shown in one of our uh, events, Autodesk University in Las Vegas a few years ago. This is just the inside of it. Outside, there is definitely uh, a wall or a texture covering it. And they were able, basically, to reduce the weight of that structure by more than 40%, whereas uh, satisfying the uh, force requirements. Their also vision is to reduce greenhouse emissions by 50%. And this is why they're using generative design with Autodesk. I'll leave you with this video that shows how their designers in Germany are going on with the generative design. Thank you. 
of if our passport is the biggest thing means we have to reduce weight. With Wyoming's backlog, we have a very massive potential of 50%. We have up to 95% raw materials and we have the chance to reduce the production size by 50%. This is really a very big step on an aircraft. And this is just possible with generative design using autodesk software. If this works, it works everywhere else. Now step by step, we start to do a few more uh, training parts and see where we can implement product design. I see here the biggest change I've ever seen. We have very long life products. So each kilogram that we doesn't design in today doesn't cost fuel burn the next 25 years. It helps our customers, the airlines, and it helps the environment. So he mentioned 95% material, raw material usability. So 5% only of the raw material is being wasted. Compare that to the other manufacturing uh, techniques available like the subtractive one where most of the material is being wasted and up to 50% reduction in material uh, weight. Yeah, also if we uh, change the design now and optimize the design now, uh, the aircraft industry can benefit for the next 25 years he was mentioning. So just reducing uh, each part with some kilograms will help us in saving fuel so the plane plane can can fly longer and also the flight cost the tickets can be cheaper so uh, we can fly even more so that's the importance of uh, designing uh, optimizing the uh, each part of a of a plane and by the way that bulk hat is now is undergoing testing and probably in the coming year or two will be available in the airbus a320 specifically so you might find that on one of the flights that you're taking in the near future. Uh, just to mention that uh, the guys at Airbus said something about bionic partition. Basically what the software is doing is replicating nature. This is an example from Tokyo. And the engineers in Tokyo specified nodes where those white nodes, by the way, are just like food, sugar or glucose. And at the middle, they have some so sort of uh, slime mold or bacteria and they've witnessed how does this organism go about to find out the shortest path and the best path to get into the uh, food source. That model was used to design the uh, Tokyo Rail Network because apparently, as I mentioned earlier, nature is very efficient. And then at the very end, you get an idea about the rail network. So they've used those paths to replicate them in the rail network of Tokyo and divide the paths and the loads on each of the nodes. This is basically what generative design is doing, is replicating those intelligent processes. To give you more idea about generative design, I've picked one example from infrastructure. So whenever you're designing a retaining wall, abutment or grading, for those of you who uh, would aspire to become civil engineers, you do have some uh, problems to solve. Generative design helps you to come up with many different alternatives and even, as Sorin mentioned, optimize an existing design. So what we're doing here is basically optimizing the material, the back, backfill material, sand or rocks, that need to be placed before or after the bridge to maintain the stability of the bridge. That's one example. There are many other examples now in the Autodesk Labs and they will be shown later on this year or next year. Another example to move from infrastructure to buildings is basically leveraging the generative design to come up with different alternatives of a villa or even a tower with certain requirements, number of inhabitants, number of built up area, etc., etc. So let me play this short video. And even coming up with different alternatives for the facade, as you can see, number of floors, number of rooms, layouts, etc., etc. Another very good example, and this is a pilot project, uh, is our Toronto office. Who, uh, who, any one of you who would like to visit the Toronto Autodesk office will, will notice that it's a very different layout than any other office in the world because this is the first example of a generatively designed office space. Meaning, before actually building the office, the people 
who are in charge of building it, interviewed all the employees who will work inside the office. And they've seen, for example, that I would like to be seated next to a window and have an external view. And I would like to be not far away from the kitchen or the pantry where I would like to go get my coffee. Other people decided, no, they want to be near the AC vent. They would like to have a cold area. So they've taken all this input into account and they fed this information with the limitations of the geometry to generative design. They ended up with this. So I'm just gonna run the video and give you an idea of what happened. This is the layout or the uh, per uh, perimeter or boundary of the office space. So this is the fixed constraints and the columns as well, these are fixed. Exactly. How many fro floors we intend to have in the building? What are the fixed areas we need to have some meeting spaces, social areas, specialty facilities, and interviewing each and every individual. Where does he stand within the organization? Then specifying requirements, adjacency, adjacency, sorry. Work style preference, a close, uh, proximity to a window. Took that information into uh, the mind and then we went into the process where the generative design was at the center of it. You send that information to the cloud with all the constraints and requirements as uh, Sorin mentioned. You specify some other constraints like the boundaries. For example, we have structural columns or we have certain structural partitions. Also specify centers for certain areas. And then maybe like a blocks. So this is a space required for collaboration. This space is required for the kitchen. And just let the generative design software come up with all the different iterations of the design. And as you can see, we have different options and different uh, basically paths being drawn to show that for this individual, this is the shortest path to get to the pantry or to the toilet or whatever. And everything is being simulated. So you can see how the layouts will be. So we can see with heat, heat maps yeah. where we have more crowds so we can see where people will, will gather more and in those areas maybe we need to uh, decrease the number of furniture so people can walk freely yeah. and these are the criteria which they've used so daylight for each alternative this is the daylight level this is the work uh, workspace work style preference adjacency to windows views and as a designer you can pick the one that basically is uh, of best interest Definitely they came up with tens or hundreds of different alternatives and in order to plot them, you need a graph like this. So these are the criteria and this each and every line is for one single design option or layout option. Thousands. Then they've plot them against two uh, uh, criteria, productivity versus workability, productivity versus adjacency or whatever. And as Soren mentioned earlier, you can isolate uh, some of the designs in order to eliminate others, and then it becomes easy for you to pick the best one to be implemented. So here highlighting where are the cabins, the meeting rooms, and even the desks of the employees. Can you see over there we have a tilted or inclined desk? This is all because of generative design. You can come up with designs that you would never ever th th think of or even imagine. Session takeaways. You've already seen that we do a lot of work in generative design. The expectations in the industry, what people think, this is the expectations, that the designer spends very small amount of time in CAD, in AutoCAD or Fusion 360, and then the rest of the design is, is all in generative. Whereas in reality, this is what happens. The designer or engineer spends most of his time in the CAD world like Soren did, he specified the constraints, the geometry, the loads, the type of material, and the generative part is just the small bit of sending this, these requirements and constraints to the cloud, getting those alternatives, and then analyze them. So once we're done with the generative design part, we go into post-processing to see which alternative is better, and then we can simulate the performance, whether it's for load, for bending, deflection, etc. This is just showing the percentage of time spent if we look into the time saving, there is definitely time saving, about maybe 40 to 50 percent in the overall process. Last and but not least, 
if anybody asks you after this session, okay, you've attended the session about generative design. What can you tell me about it? How can I benefit from it? These are the three major benefits of alternative design or generative design, basically. First, it allows you to explore a wider range of design options, thousands of things that you would never ever uh, come up with. Make impossible designs possible. Things like that uh, component over there that is interlinked with too many different, uh, uh, basically, uh, threads. And finally, optimize for material and manufacturing methods, whether you wanna produce it uh, using the subtractive or additive manufacturing. Additional sources uh, on the Autodesk website, or if you guys uh, usually read the articles uh, from the Harvard Business Review, there is one specifically about generative design. And I highly recommend that you check our Autodesk generative design website. So whenever you go on Google, just type Autodesk generative design, and then just click on the first link that appears on your search uh, list of results. Sorry? Yeah, I just want to mention uh, one thing uh, before we wrap up. Um, no, this technology is quite new. Uh, when I was uh, your age, these things are, were like science fiction, you know. Now they are here, they are available. So you are uh, lucky because you have them. And I encourage you to be curious. And the fact that you are here, it's a, it's a very positive thing and it will be very helpful for you if, if you try this out. So just be curious, attend this kind of events, follow, follow our Autodesk webpage and uh, install these tools and start to play with them because if you know these tools, uh, when you start your careers, uh, you will have a, a definite advantage uh, in comparison with other people who are not curious about these things. So uh, if you have uh, any questions, we, are open, we open the floor for questions or feedbacks. If you don't have questions, yes, we have a question. Uh, my question is about the generative uh, design and generative uh, and additive uh, manufacturing. Now, all of those tweaks and uh, bends here and there, they allowed, uh, they allowed uh, for example, dust and other uh, external things to uh, build up in the, in, the, in the design or in the uh, object we uh, built. Wouldn't that be a, a, a reason for more corrosion to happen to the object we created? Great question. It actually depends on the material used, right? And let's not forget that this is just the main structure or the backbone of any object. You can basically coat it with protective material and you can basically maybe fill it with lightweight material like foam. So we're just showing you in terms of the bulkhead for the Airbus, just the internal structure. But on the outside, whenever you're, you're flying, you won't see those links in there. So yeah. any other question? Okay, so uh, my question is that uh, when would companies which manufacture like these products take subtractive manufacturing over uh, this addict, uh, additive? So I showed one curve, but I'll explain it in simple words. Uh, both techniques are very useful and they have their use cases. Depending on the object that you want to produce, if it's not a complex object, it's something, for example, like this, right? You don't need additive manufacturing, but if something that's generated from generative design with all of these internal mini links, then you need additive manufacturing. You couldn't do it without uh, additive manufacturing. The other thing is the cost of production. If the object that you're trying to produce and sell can have a high price in the market, then you can go with additive manufacturing because the technology itself costs money. It's not uh, cheap, to be honest. Yeah. And still, it's still not, the cost is still higher Probably in the future it will uh, go down the same like the, when mobile phones appear first, they were very expensive. Now everybody has a mobile phone. It's the same, this technology is still new. Uh, now it's still considered expensive, but uh, looking at the benefits, more and more companies are adopting this. And of course, gradually the cost will be cheaper and cheaper. And we can. this will become the, uh, the new normal, the same like mobile phones now are uh, normality. Yes. Uh, my question is, if, uh, why does Airbus is thinking uh, 30 years ahead? Uh, well, I mean, wh why isn't it something that could be done in a fewer uh, number of years? Like, 
why can't they achieve what they're trying to achieve in, for example, 2013 instead of 2050, which is after 30 years from now? Uh, it's a great question, but I don't work for Airbus. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it's because they're expecting some technologies to evolve. And once these technologies are available, they will be able to create the, the design of their you know, dreams. So, because certain things are not available that's, right now. There's one thing and another thing is to change the design of a new aircraft, it's, it's not as easy as changing the design of a phone, for example, which you can release in six months or one year. Uh, planes are, are more complex and the cost to fabricate a plane is higher. And even the cost of the plane itself so when it takes more time to design it, it takes more time to fabricate it, and it takes more money. That's why uh, the, the timing is a bit longer for planes, designing of planes. Uh, all the technology that is there, everything has to be simulated, and it's also the safety thing. Like a mobile phone, you drop it, you buy a new one. With a plane, you can't drop it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's additional testing, additional things that they, they need to, to take in account. Absolutely true. It's actually the most regulated industry worldwide is the aviation industry. So to change one component, the designer or manufacturer has to go through tens of thousands of testing hours to prove that this component is suitable for flying. So I think that's one of the reasons. Yeah. Here we have a question there. So, so in generative design uses AI to do all the stuff. So what's the use of computational design? Because or, or they have to do everything manually. So compared to that, this is better. So how is computational design going to help if this is the case? Yeah, it's, it's a good uh, question. And uh, computational design and generative designs are, are two different technology, but at the same time, they complete each other. OK? so. Um, generative design, it's using algorithms from computational design, right? Uh, computational design is something that you, depending on the case, right? And uh, the cost that you are, uh, computational design is, is a cheaper option, right? Because you can control everything, you can create your design, you can, you can manipulate it there, you can reuse it afterwards. Uh, generative design, it will be a bit, the cost will be a bit higher. And the algorithms it, uh, are less, you have less control because you just let the automation do the design for you. You will have a lighter uh, material saving and all that, but uh, you, you don't have so much control of how the algorithm works. You need to learn programming, you need to, you know, generative design, you can adjust it. You can make small adjustments by yourself. You just replace a node with some other nodes, and uh, you, you can adjust the, the designs. So there are, there are two technologies that they complete each other. There are two tools that you can use depending on the, the need. And they, they can be used also in different domains. Uh, yesterday, I was showing you uh, computational design more like for construction space, for architecture. It's very easy. Because architects, for example, they don't have the knowledge of computing, they didn't study uh, IT or computing computing science, so they can they can build their scripts using computational design easier, and they can manipulate automate some small things. Okay. So add one more thing: anything complex that needs optimization and infinite computing power, that's generative design. Anything mm -hmm. kind of simple automation, I would say computational would be the best. Uh, and as I was mentioning, cost. Because if you use a license of generative design, it will cost you a bit more than using Revit with Dynamo, for example. So just to add on this, so whenever you're sending your model to generative design, you're using the servers from Autodesk or Amazon. This service is not for free. So you have to purchase or have what we call a cloud credits. And the cloud credits will be consumed based on the complexity of your design. So that's another difference. It's, it's free for students. Yeah, yeah it's, it's free for students, so make use of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, is it, uh, isn't Dynamo the same as the generative design? No, so Dynamo is a computational design, parametric 
visual programming. So it's, uh, as I was mentioning, it's, um, it's a different technology where you can create your own scripting, your own you know, automations. While uh, generative design, you are using AI, so it's a bit more advanced. It's because the, the scripting, the, the intelligence is already created in the cloud and it's, you are using multiple machines to process this. And generative design can generate the designs for you. In computational design, you need to generate those options by using sliders. So you, you, you can build up the, the scripting, the, the, the program. Uh, yeah, so if there's a new company coming up and they want, uh, auto, they, they want uh, Autodesk to be implemented in their system, and uh, like, so how do they go about it? Like, do they uh, train their uh, employees like from beginning or like do they hire like already trained employees or like how do they go about it? So depending on the uh, company, um, some of them, they hire, they have, when they hire people, they specify as a requirement. You need to know this software. You need to know Revit. You need to know AutoCAD. So it comes as a requirement. Most of the most of the companies, um, but others they invest in training their personnel. So they have some uh, minimum requirements. Like you have to know at least AutoCAD or you have to know some CAD. But if uh, the company is rich enough, they can pay for your training once you. you okay. So if uh, they, they see that they will get more benefit uh, by using uh, latest technologies. They will invest in training their workforce on, on using the latest technology. But of course, they need to be aware that they need to invest and they need to spend a bit upfront, but then they will get more uh, return of investment after that. Uh, so uh, there are, we work with partners. We have uh, our partners uh, here in the region, uh, which can provide training course. Okay, so you can attend the course. They have different fees for different levels. Beginners can be one fee, and they can give you a certification. So you can become a Revit certified professional. You can add that in your CV, and of course you will have a better opportunity from somebody who's not certified. You know. Um, so this is one way to attend like uh, uh, trainings from partners or there are plenty of materials online. There are courses online and for students especially, I recommend to, to uh, check Autodesk Design uh, Academy. Autodesk Design Academy. Just Google this, Autodesk Design Academy and you can create an account there and you have free trainings for most of our products for students. So if you are a student, you can create a free account and you will get free trainings, free training course with lessons, videos. So it's like uh, attending a course, but this time is online. So you can do it in your free time and you can learn all this uh, software. Any other questions, feedbacks? Did you like the session? Yeah. What did you like most? about this? The presenters, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> we wish. <laughs> yeah? that it's showing us uh, a new way of uh, design. Even though I wasn't actually interested in design before, it uh, opened my eyes to something, uh, like a new field that I can be uh, trained on or something like that. But at the same time, I have to be honest. There are things that I liked about this course, and then of course there are things that I didn't like about this course. I think that it was a little bit too specific when it came to constructions and stuff like that. I think if it was more general in a, in a way, it would have been more interesting to people to stay focused, you know, because if it was a specific subject, people will start to fade out, even if they were attending, in a way. So that was my feedback. And sorry if it was uh, harsh or anything. It's, it's okay. Is that, 
It's actually a very good feedback, so thanks for, for it. It's very valuable for us. So what we try to uh, do, we, we try to serve some high level presentation to understand the concept, but what I, we wanted also is to show how to do it so you don't get the wrong idea that this generative design can do anything for me. So you, you watch nice videos, wow, I don't have to do anything. Okay, I just subscribe to generative design and I want a, a nice building, hey, do me a nice building. No, you have, that's why we wanted to make it a bit more, you know, technical, specific. I know it's a bit painful because you're on holiday and you don't want to see like loads and, you know, <laughs> and trusses and all this. But the purpose of it is to, to emphasize on the fact that it, you, we still need you guys as uh, operators of this technology. And you need to operate it by doing some clicks, inputting some loads, clicking here and there. So that's why. So very good, very good feedback. Thank you. This is exactly why I've put that slide. <laughs> so this is where your part comes into the picture, up till here. <laughs> <laughs> and then again here and over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. But thanks for the feedback. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> More, more, more negative ones. <laughs> is generative design being used in the space industry, like for building rockets or satellites? Uh, something was shown about SpaceX, but I'm not sure if we're involved in it. It was shown in one of the Autodesk events, so maybe. I have to check. What about 3D printing? Like, are the rockets being 3D printed? <laughs> uh, currently, I can say no, but maybe in the future. Who knows, yeah. Sorry, I don't have a definitive answer to this, but might be. Uh, as we have talked, on all the topics, uh, everything is based on algorithms. And algorithms are also, uh, the data is also being used on uh, algorithms. But all the data can be corrupted, corrupted in any other manner. So to protect that, what can be used? Okay, what's happening with the generative design, and this is the good thing, you have all the data because this is what you've created on your computer on premise. You're only sending an instance, a copy of what you've created to the cloud. The cloud will run the simulation and then will send you the options. So basically nothing is lost in the cloud. The cloud is just a service, just to run the cal calculation, just to come with different alternatives, and then we'll send them down back to you so that you download them on your machine and then continue with the process. So there is no risk of losing data or losing any intelligence or effort. Yes? Does the, does the student uh, package include the cloud services or is it separate? Yes, you have some credits as a student. You have a number of credits so you can do some tests on your own. I'm not sure exactly how many, but uh, yeah, you get some credits so you can test some designs. In what sense? Linux? No, I didn't get it. Any limits to generative design? Anything that cannot be done in generative design? Mm, of course, you, there should be, there are limits. There are things that you cannot, I mean, you can do everything with generative design. You can do uh, optimized objects or buildings or designs, yeah? but you cannot create food. <laughs> or maybe, you know, I, had, I, heard, I heard that they are doing like, they are 3D printing now food, 3D printing chocolate. So they just put the uh, ingredients and so probably in one, 100 years, uh, you have a machine in your home, you want some spaghetti, you just press a button, it will print the spaghetti. So. Yes. Actually, uh, chocolate and the human, human body tissue. So they're 3D printing now cells in a tissue format so that they can replace organs or uh, rectify certain malfunctioning organs. So in, in the labs as well, but not with Autodesk. This is something on the side. So we really don't know if there are any limitations. If you look, watch uh, sci-fi movies or series, they can even print humans. There's a there's a show, a TV show that they actually printed, a draw, uh, how do you call, it? human replicas 
and they created like a park, amusement park, with humans. Yeah, Westworld. So probably that will be here. Maybe not in 100 years, but who knows? In 1,000 years or no? The yeah. <laughs> Okay. Any other comments, feedback, questions? Yes, please. Uh, so as a business-wise, you mentioned that some companies can train their workforce to work on Autodesk. What is easier for the company or what is um, cutting the cost more? Cooperating with the Autodesk or training their workforce on Autodesk? Uh, to be honest, I think business-wise, for them, it will be most cost of, more cost effective to hire people that are already trained. So that's where you can be smart. You know, you can train yourself, and you will have a higher advantage to be hired by a company because for them it will mean less cost. Okay, when you go there and I say I don't know anything, can you train me? They will look. Okay, it will cost me another I don't know how many thousands of, of dollars to train you. Maybe uh, I'll, I'll look for somebody who already has these trainings. So learning these tools will help you get jobs faster. And also the time constraint. Some companies have deadlines to deliver projects and they don't have time to bring in yeah. employees and train them and let them become familiar with the tools. No, they want somebody who's expert to start delivering on the requirements. So it really depends. But we don't deliver training from Autodesk. We deliver trainings through our partners. But the examination, that once you, for example, uh, finish the training, you sit for an examination, that examination is from Autodesk. And if you pass that examination, as Sorin mentioned, you get certified. So it's internationally certified Autodesk user for a certain product. Yeah. Okay, other, other questions, feedbacks, negative feedbacks, positive? <laughs> okay, I think we can Perfect. wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you. And make sure you enjoy your vacation. <laughs> I hope we, we didn't uh, torture you too much with the <laughs> presentation. Thank you.